So we're going to read the scriptures together. So first of all, from Acts, uh, sorry, from Romans, and uh, we're going to read this. So from Romans 16, uh, 1 to 7. Paul, writing at the end of this letter to the Romans, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at St. Sophia. So you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many, and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. Greet Andronica and Julia, my fellow Israelites who are in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. Lord, as we think about this scripture and other scriptures, help us, we pray, that in 20 minutes of your plan and purpose for your church and for our church, we will be the name of Jesus. Amen. So, this is the closing sermon in our series that we've been looking at women in the Bible. Series called Tell Her Story. Uh, we've looked at women from Eve, and now we've arrived at the end of the story, with, in the Bible at least, with these women at Paul Greek in Rome. And each day we've seen that God has used women, and they are instrumental as agents of his purposes, and sometimes taking leadership. But this is in contrast to the view so often held that women are somehow secondary to men and subservient to them. Uh, at its worst, the view that women's place must be confined to the home and the kitchen. It's a sound view that such views are still vehemently defended by some in the 21st century church where in almost every sphere of life in our society, women work alongside men. In medicine, you're far more likely to see a woman GP than you are a man. In education and in the academy, in business, and even in the military, those places where they often thought it was only for men, women now work in stores alongside men. They're not always in equal proportion, but they're present nonetheless. And it makes it all the starker when some in the church say that women have no role to be needed, and that they should be subservient and keep quiet. It's a sound thing that we still have to make a big decision for women's leaders. Perhaps the closer we get to Paul's letter, the stronger that fight becomes. But I hope that we'll see this morning that even when it seems at its most prohibitive, actually in the New Testament church, at their best, when those churches were at their best, women served alongside men. It all depends on the lens we apply to Scripture. The technical term are the hermeneutical presuppositions. Now, who's heard of hermeneutical presuppositions before this morning? Uh, yes, some hands up. So, if some, some of you have heard of hermeneutical presuppositions, well, 
rest of you are thinking, what on earth is Paul talking about today? It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? But all it means is those ideas that we bring with us when we read the Bible. Claire asked us this morning uh, to help us, to ask God to help us when we read the Bible. And when we read the Bible, we already have a whole lot of ideas that we bring to it. Otherwise, it would take no sense to us at all, would it? Have those ideas about words that we all have in our text. And so we need to be aware of what we bring to Scripture, as well as what we read from Scripture. Uh, and before we launch into our text from Romans today, which lists those women that call themselves men and recognizes as being those who want them to their churches at the grace of Ruth, Phoebe, who's a deacon, uh, Prisca, who's a fellow worker, and Eugenia, a female name, which describes her as an apostle working alongside her husband and Barnabas. But let me illustrate how we bring this lens to Scripture. The, uh, the predominant belief that people had about women and men held in the time of the church likely to really quite recently, probably about a century ago, was that women were biologically secondary to men. Even as recently as the 18th century, there were debates in this country about whether women could have a soul or not, and, and whether women could reason, or whether they had an intellect. Uh, uh, the friends of Mrs. Lister were in my position. Uh, that was only 200 years ago, people were still having those debates. And a common view in the early church and all the way through really to probably uh, about 200 years ago was that uh, men were perfect. <laughs> men were perfect and women were deficient in some way. And that explains the biological difference between men and women. Well, it all sounds very ridiculous to us now. And frankly, it was. But you see, such ideas take root when the rest of society says that men are important and women are not, when men rule and women obey. Uh, when you come with all of those sorts of ideas and you begin to read the Bible, what you do is you read those things in the Bible that would support your view. And the Bible has to begin to challenge those views. And so when Paul says in 1 Timothy, I do not permit a woman to teach or hold, or hold authority over a man, or in 1 Timothy 14 to keep quiet when church is happening, Paul seems to be supporting this imbalance between women and men. And I suspect that Paul, as a teacher of his time, did see Paul understanding with that men were more important than women, because that was everywhere in his world at that time. In the Roman world, it was true. In the Greek world, it was true. And certainly in the Jewish world, it was true. So let me take one little example of how we might read the Scripture with a different lens. First of all, in 1 Corinthians 7, in 25 to 28, that's that next slide, if you see it, um, Paul is asking a question to the Corinthian churches uh, about whether people should um, change their marital status now they become Christians. Here's actually what he writes. He says, Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the law. But it is my opinion, as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy, I think that in view of the impending crisis, it's well for you to remain as you are. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek to be. But if you marry, you do not sin. And if a virgin marries, she does not sin. He pulled it away. He's just giving his advice. This is his opinion, I suppose. The Lord hasn't told him this, but he just says, oh, it's a wise thing because there's 
a big crisis on earth. I do think, by the way, that many young married couples are hesitant about having children because they are aware of the common crisis in our environment. They think, you know, maybe they have been children into a world which could be so damaging to them in their time. So it's a crisis, and so people adjust their behavior. And I think Paul is simply saying there's a crisis coming in. The crisis is a man who says, okay, here's my opportunity. So sometimes when we read what Paul says, we've got to recognize that he's a teacher, not pointing out to us what told him to instruct the church about. And so later, he instructs the church, the same church in Antioch, about whether women should wear veils in the temple or now they need to go to the A hundred years ago, or probably even 50 years ago, most of you who are women in the church this morning would have something on your head. A hat, probably your other grand hat, um, or something uh, certainly to cover your head. Because in fact, what you did when you went to church. I'm looking now to see how many are wearing a hat this morning. It's only, it's only a man. Hi there. I love the hat. I was going to make the point that actually you're far more likely to see a man wearing a hat in church um, than you are a woman wearing a hat in church this morning. Why is it that we have so comprehensively ignored Paul's advice? <laughs> Why is it we don't do that anymore in church? Certainly when I was growing up in church, the church would be full of women and they would be wearing hats. I think it's because we come to the conclusion that that was important in Paul's day, but it doesn't mean anything in our day. And so we have freedom to wear a hat or not. And frankly, um, uh, women and men, if you want to wear a hat to church, you're entitled to do so as long as you wear something else. In fact, some of us men have to wear a hat so we're getting home from church if it's sunny outside, otherwise we get our dark hat. So men, probably, some of us, without much care, have to wear hats more um, importantly than some of the women. But why is Paul instructing them? Why is he so insistent on this? Because he says he instructs it everywhere. Let me tell you why I think that's the case. If you were a respectable woman in Paul's day, you were married, and you were a good character, uh, you might have been a widow, but you were happily married, what you would do to show you were uh, uh, a respectable woman would be to cover your head with a veil. And that's how people would know that you are to be honored and that you're respectable. If you were a slave, or if you had come to Christ and were, had been, or maybe were still working as a prostitute, then you would not have your head covered. And that's how people would know that you're not worthy of honor. That you can be dismissed and ignored and looked down on. So why does Paul say that he insists that all the churches where he has a door, that all the women must have their hands covered. Is it because he wants to insist that men are better than women? Or is it because he wants to say, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter whether you're a slave or a married person, you'll all look the same in church and they'll all be treated exactly the same. Isn't that the way? Paul is instructing the women in the churches, not really about whether they're married or not, but he's saying, all of you are the same in Christ Jesus. We've all had a new beginning in Christ. And so we all treat one another exactly the same. You see, 
Actually, when Paul sometimes seems to us to be someone who is rather dismissive of this, actually, if we read that passage, we have to look at it in that sense of carefully and see it. But it creates this theological argument why he's justifying this, and then he demolishes it by saying that actually all of them never get to him or give him anyway, don't they? So, um, so maybe we are in the same way. <laughs> you can see him getting himself into all sorts of I think he's been a bit mischievous as well. He's still having his discussion. But he's doing this in Christian because he wants to say they all stand on the same ground. They're all equal in Christ. In fact, when you read in Galatians the most fundamental conviction that Paul has is this. For in Christ Jesus there is neither slave nor free, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor are all are one in Christ. Church, this morning, we are the most equal community on the planet. Because our fundamental identity is all the same. Whether we're richer or poorer, whether we're men or women, whatever our racial background, However long we've been a Christian, years and years or just a few weeks of that, we are all equal in Christ. We are here in the So when Paul comes to write to the um, Christians in Rome, at the end of his letter, he lists the people he wants them to remember as suffering. And uh, here's his little list. The next slide, if you could. The first person he lists is Phoebe. Okay, a woman. Phoebe he describes as a deacon of the church, and uh, that place called uh, Saint. I can't remember. It. That place was the port for Corinth, and. As a deacon, she was probably the pastor of that little church community. And she had, she was the person, Paul says, would you take a letter to the church in Rome at this time? And she says, yes, I'll do that. And so she's the person who carried this uh, letter, probably by across land and by boat, into Rome. And she's the person who read it already, probably Paul's read it with her, and she's asked him perhaps the question, well, what do you mean by that, Paul? And Paul said, well, I meant this. So she's probably also the person who first teaches the Roman Christians what this letter means. The first interpreter of the letter to the Romans was a guy called Phoebe. Phoebe. And Paul says, whatever she needs from you, Help her out. She's a friend of his and a sister in Christ. She's still quite young. And they can be in this passage, this letter that we now call the letter to the Romans, and that church. He says, Greet Prisca and Aquila. A couple who, he says, had risked their necks for him. Wow. Prisca uh, is the female name. Aquila is the man, and we know from elsewhere in the New Testament that they were their their work was as tent makers and metal makers. Does anybody know another Christian in the early church who was a tent maker? Paul. So these are a couple who uh, are doing the same job as Paul when he's not being a missionary and an apostle in Colossae, but he needs to work for a living. He makes tents. This couple did as well, and we think that when, in AD 49, Emperor Claudius banned all of the Christians from Rome, they fled to Corinth, taking their business with them, and that's where Paul and Prisca and Aquila worked together. We also know from 1 Corinthians 16, 19, that they worked with Paul and Apollos as well. So these are co-workers, and that the church meets in their homes. One of the little house churches in this great imperial city of Rome 
Chi in the home of Sister Anna Chia, and Sister Ibrahim Hayek. How did she believe her? Can you put that up? They're this happy lot. They're now back in Rome, but it took faith to do this. Please tell why. And then he greets Mary or Miriam, as she sometimes is called. We don't know anything about her. Uh, we don't know who she is. We just know she has Miriam name. And then, most significantly of all, and this is why we did that little experiment of looking at the scripture through a different lens, a married couple described as apostles called Andronicus and Junia. Now, Junia is very clear in the Greek, that's what the word means. But for much of church history, those who interpret the Bible thought, Junior, woman's name, apostle, that part is true, maybe it's a spelling mistake. We'll rename Anna Junior. And for most of church history, Junior, the woman, became Junior, the man, because people thought a woman could possibly be an apostle. Isn't that extraordinary? You see, what was going on was that they were bringing their own ideas to Scripture and saying, well, I think that Scripture might be wrong there, so we'll change Scripture. But really, if we ask God to help us read our Bible, what happens is we allow Scripture to change our thinking. But we think more like God and do it like Scripture. That's the hermeneutic presupposition at the time. And it's clear that this were a couple, Andronicus and Junior. And the, this man and this woman, they were described by Paul as apostles. Paul calls himself an apostle because these are people who are like missionaries, leaders in the church. And they're there in the Roman church. And maybe they were the, the apostolic leadership of that church. Both of them equally. Here at the heart of the empire, the church in Rome had been established by women and men, serving and leading and working together. And as we read our scriptures carefully, that's what we have to do. They had discovered what Paul had also discovered when he and that were working together. They began to listen to him. That in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. We are all equal in Christ. How much more then in our time, which does value the role of men, skills and the wisdom of women, how to limit what women can do, how to educate women to the very highest standard, where women can become MPs, where women can become Prime Minister. Who is it? How much do you need to hear this radical undercurrent of the gospel? Which says we are all women in Christ. We don't limit in this church women's ministry to simply working with the kids or to seeing the male pastor to do such a stuff as you do. As something you're about to conduct an ordained service at St. Paul Ministry and our ministry and training event in September, you will be conducting an ordained Prime Minister training service. We do that because we bread the new church. <laughs> so, brothers and sisters in Christ, let me say to you, whether you're a man or a woman, the most important thing is to say not what can I do because I'm a woman, but what can't I do because I'm a woman, but what can I do because I'm a different gender than you? I'm a follower of Christ. And if God's calling you to leadership, God's calling you to serve. Say no. If God's 
people who step into a role that you think, oh, <laughs> I've only ever seen men do it. But God is there. And you can do it. Because God wants us to be this radical, fruitful, vibrant, new community that wants to run down to the world. He wants fire to turn up of everything that's ever been. You dismissed it because you thought, well, I couldn't do that on my own. And I couldn't do that on my own. Was in fact what you need to say, I could do that. You know, I can help myself. And whatever God calls us to do and be in the life of the church, we can only do it. As God works with us in the marriage of our God, works with us and leads us and guides us and inspires us in all that we do. And I'm going to come to communion. It's a place where we can 